so we'll get started. Um, uh, my name is Trent McConaughey, and um, I'm one of the people helping to build and deploy Ocean Protocol. Uh, tonight, we're actually going to have um, two uh, sort of sets of talks. The first one is around the product, and the second one is around the token distribution. Uh, the first one um, was originally scheduled to be just me, but um, I've recruited some of my teammates who have a lot more precise things to say about parts of the technology. So I will be joined later on um, for demos by my colleague Jerry, is Jerry in the audience right now? Great. And my colleague Marcus in there, as well as um, for a Q&A at the end, my colleague Don will join us. So I'm going to be talking about the Ocean Protocol V1 product release um, and sort of actually starting from the beginning of Ocean and a bit towards well, where we are and where we're headed. Uh, and then uh, in the second part of the, the evening, uh, my colleague Bruce will be talking more about some of the stuff on the tokens themselves and stuff. So, but I get to talk about the, the fun engineering things and the vision stuff and all that. So that's really what I like to talk about. And I always take an opportunity to have pretty pictures of jellyfish because they're cool. Um, that's, all, that's all I can say. I didn't wear a jellyfish t-shirt today, but sorry. Actually, do you guys want to see? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I do have a good one for you. So just to kind of kick things off, did you know there's a conspiracy? the fish are trying to take over the planet. And they are coming up to the surface and calling themselves Aquamen and saying that they're trying to help us. This is the truth, folks. <laughs> so anyway, um, that, that's obviously not true. Um, Aquaman isn't real, we think, but we'll see. Um, let's get started with, with a presentation. So Ocean Protocol V1 product release. If you go back, um, you know, over the number, last number of years, we've started to realize that Data is extremely valuable. It seems that with every passing week, we hear news about Facebook um, acting badly, um, and in general, um, learning about that data can have value. And part of the reason is, once you have data, then you can build more accurate AI models, and from that, you can build more profitable businesses, solve um, important problems, and so on. Um, but the problem is, data in general is closed. Um, and sort of by analogy, there has been this money economy uh, traditionally, it was opaque with concentrated power, concentrated by the Fed and banks. And, um, but the blockchain movement has um, been opening it up to be transparent and permissionless with things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and this is really the token economy. We envision that just as we, the blockchain movement, has opened up money, let's open up data. Moving it from something that is opaque with concentrated power and wealth, um, from the Facebooks and Googles of the world, to something that is transparent and permissionless, where we can spread the benefits of AI and data to a much broader set of people. And that's really what we envision as the Web3 data economy, and that's why we're building Ocean, to help to catalyze that. So towards this, you know, what does it look like towards data? and um, towards opening up data in general and making a data economy. Turns out that AI is the linchpin. Um, I, I've spent a long time in the world of AI. Um, my very first job back in the day, um, uh, that wasn't um, working on my father's farm, shoveling pig manure. Uh, my very first job was actually an AI researcher. So I went straight from being a farm boy to an AI researcher. <laughs> and this was in the 90s. Um, I was given a data set of about 20,000 data points. And I was asked to classify between one of 13 different classes. One class was birds flying, another one was people walking, another one was a tank driving. And I had to classify. And uh, you know, with these data sets, um, th with this data set, um, I worked and worked and toiled and toiled. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I had 55% accuracy. So 45% error, almost a coin toss, terrible. At the end, I had um, improved by 10%. So it was still 35% error, abysmal results. Why? Well, my data, just, I just didn't have enough data in general. You know, I played with all these sorts of genetic algorithms and neural networks and stuff, but at the end of the day, I just did not have enough data. But what people have realized is that data is unreasonably effective for AI. So if you want to build modern AI tools, you need to have a lot of data. And that's why it's become the, the sort of the new oil, as some people say, and so on. It turns out, actually, there's a lot of companies, most companies have a lot of data. Um, um, and also, there's actually a lot of AI startups out there um, who have lots of AI expertise. But the way that you extract value is you need to um, build models off of the data and then um, figure out how to um, build models that are accurate and so on. So you need a lot of data and you need to know what you're doing with AI. Only a small number of companies have both and they have actually managed to accrue um, the large mass of the value. 
the Googles and Facebooks of the world. AI is the linchpin in this data economy. We've been asking, what if you can connect these? What if you can connect these 1,000 enterprises with 1,000 AI startups? Everyone gets lots of data and AI. What does that look like then? Um, and we've realized that it, it looks like something like this, a substrate for a data economy, where on the left side, you have enterprises, governments, NGOs with a lot of data and compute. Um, on the right side, you've got data scientists with problems to solve. Sometimes they are inside these enterprises, governments, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and you want to connect them. And on the left side, you can connect them with data that is for sale, you know, data marketplaces, not just one, but many. Uh, otherwise, that would be centralized. And of course, AI commons, not just one, but many. So you have data that is priced, data that is free, and uh, surrounding services, connecting this with the data scientists who are actually figuring out how to extract the value from the data. This is really what Ocean is about. It's the substrate for this data economy to make it really easy to have data marketplaces, liquidity of data, all of this. So then the question is, um, how do you, you know, enable these data marketplaces, these data commons? And um, it's really a supply side problem. The demand is there, right? Um, if you're an AI person, you're like, give me the data, give me the data, give me the data. You know, back in the 90s when I was doing this problem with this uh, radar data, I had these 20,000 points, but I would have been overjoyed if someone gave me 200,000 or 2 million points. Of course, that was hard back then. Um, and it's still actually amazingly hard today. So we've been asking, what can we do to maximize this supply of data to help power this data economy? And we've come up with essentially three ways. I'll talk about them. The first way is make it really low friction to create and use data marketplaces and data commons. And there's a few frictions that have been there traditionally. For example, if you are a centralized data marketplace, then anyone buying and selling data from, um, with you, they're really worried that you're going to be controlling their data or that you see their data, right? Um, so that's uh, really a challenge. So you really need to have a substrate that has really great liquidity across many, many marketplaces. And of course, same thing for commons and as well data science tools to help consume these. So you really want to have low friction across the board. And then on the bottom, we have this substrate for the data economy. So that's the first. There's two more ways too, though. The next one is, if you think about enterprises or hospitals, um, here's an example, actually. Um, a friend of mine, he's an AI researcher. He's building models of, of cancer. And he tells me he's a happy man if he has a data set of 100 people. The thing is, he's using genetic data. And so he's got thousands of, um, thousands of input variables. So he's trying to build these models that predict whether or not someone has cancer from thousands of input variables, yet only hundreds of data points. As you might expect, his models are terrible. He can't predict anything. <laughs> so, and he's been trying for years, and it's like 40% error, 35% error. It's just terrible, right? But imagine if, instead of 100 data points, he had 100 million. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, how do you do that? Well, one answer is, well, let's just pool all the data together with all the hospitals, right? Not just one hospital or five, but 500 or 5,000, right? But of course, that is a data privacy ni nightmare. Right? Um, we've heard about all these hacks of, of Equifax, hundreds of millions of credit cards, or otherwise Adhar, all this. So um, if you have you know, data sets across tens of, of millions of people or more, it's just really a problem. And so there's naturally this, te this tension of more data uh, gives you, in one hand, more accurate AI models, for example, to predict cancer better. But more data also traditionally has this problem of compromising privacy. We have these honeypots for data. But imagine if we could have our cake and eat it too. And there is an answer. The answer is you bring the compute to the data. And the compute is for building the AI models. And then what you can do is once the AI model is built, it itself can be decentralized. So at the end of the day, uh, you've got the benefit of having the AI predicting cancer, for example. Um, a a across not just 100 people, but 100 million people. Um, for my dream, actually, on things like that is, instead of detecting cancer after six months, detect it after six days. Stage one, not stage three, right? That could save millions of lives. And uh, so um, this is really possible. And then the trick is, like I show here, you bring the computer to the data. So you have the modeling algorithm. Um, and the data stays private within each hospital. And you can actually learn across hospital one and hospital two. The model starts randomly and then it goes to hospital one and updates itself uh, with the data from hospital one. And then it goes to hospital two and updates itself with the data from hospital two. Then it goes to hospital three and four and so on, all the way up to hospital 10,000. And this is the idea of actually something called federated learning. Now traditional federated learning, it's actually not that old, but traditional federated learning says, 
we'll decentralize the data at the bottom, but we will let the uh, orchestration layer be centralized and the final model be centralized. But of course, that leads to man in the middle attacks, all this personal information leaking out, and the final model might be reverse engineered. So it's really critical that you decentralize the orchestration itself um, uh, across learning across these different hospitals, as well as the final model um, where you rate limit it so that you can't yank out PII there, personal information. So this is, um, I've been talking about with Ocean, how do we overall ex um, maximize the supply of data? I've talked about low friction to create data marketplaces and data commons. I've talked about keeping control and privacy by bringing AI compute to the data. And the final one is network rewards. And those of you who have been following us with Ocean, this is kind of where we started. We're like, hey, you know, Bitcoin gives network rewards to incentivize security of the Bitcoin network. We can do a similar thing with Ocean where we give network rewards to people who supply data who make it available when asked. And um, so this is something that we're still building towards. So these are the three different ways. So uh, that's really the, the goals we've had. Now, towards building it, um, how do we get to the core of this? What has really ended up as the core of Ocean now that we've been on this journey for you know, a couple of years? The core of Ocean is decentralized orchestration. Um, and what it is is basically uh, you have this compute DAG, um, uh, directed acyclic graph, um, where you've got data coming in uh, and an algorithm coming in. It's doing some compute, say, training a neural network. That neural network is getting stored, and then you're getting analytics on the end. And of course, this is just a very simple compute graph, but it could become much more complicated. And how do you specify this compute graph? We have something called uh, a service execution agreement, or C. Get it? Um, of course you do. Um, anyway, um, so I see, <laughs> and uh, this is actually a decentralized version of the traditional um, service level agreement that you find in enterprise big data arrangements. So this is really the heart of Ocean. Ocean is um, making it possible to run these in a decentralized fashion. So you have this traditional SLA that now can run in sort of an unstoppable way, if you will, to use Ethereum terminology. Um, so decentralized orchestration and the surrounding tooling, you know, the higher level tooling and so on, it powers these three ways to supply data. It helps to power um, building data marketplaces, data commons, and data science tools. It helps to power bringing compute to the data so that we can build these AI models without the data honeypots. And it helps to power the network rewards. But at the heart, we have these Cs um, that are run with decentralized orchestration. So if you're a data scientist or an AI person, why would you care? Right? And we see it as three more things. It's way more data. I've talked about that uh, via the data commons, as well as enterprise data uh, without the data escapes. Uh, provenance is another big thing. Um, a friend of mine uh, used to run data at SoundCloud, and he, he was telling me how they had amazing algorithms that they had models, AI models that they had built to recommend uh, music, but they couldn't ship them because they didn't know where the data came from. So it would have been illegal from a personal private data perspective. So they didn't, right? But imagine if you did have the provenance, the history of all that data, then you can do something about that. As well as the provenance um, helps towards the data honeypots. And finally, um, opportunities for income, you know, not just um, building and shipping marketplaces on top to buy and sell um, data, not dissimilar to today's, to today's token exchanges um, like, like Binance or GDAX, but also for things like generating data, cleaning it, uh, feature engineering of the data, and so on, um, curation. So there's a lot of new opportunities that will be benefiting data scientists and even more, a more broad set of people, right, people who want to do generalized mining from the sort of crypto world. So I've got a couple more slides here, and then I'll be handing off to the demos, um, to the guys for the demos. But I wanted to just run through, run through with you uh, sort of where we've come from, from with Ocean and where we're headed. So a brief history. Um, we've been working on blockchain as, as an orga organization since 2013, but we really started getting into Ocean, excuse me, um, in fall of 2016, where we started to realize that, oh, wow, decentralized data marketplaces um, could be really important to help change this problem with the data monopolies and um, the opaque data. So we realized that you know, they'd be very useful. That was um, you know, more than two years ago now. Um, and then in spring of 2017, we worked with Toyota Research Institute. Um, they saw that for self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles, um, they need a ton of data. In fact, Rand has said you need 500 billion miles driven in order to get accurate enough uh, models for cars so that your cars are, can drive more safely than humans. right? And they did the numbers for themselves, and they realized that it would take them 20 years. So that wasn't very useful for them. And they realized that what they needed to do was pool their data with the other automakers. Uh, so with them, we built a decentralized data marketplace, a prototype just to see, and it worked out quite nicely. And from that, that actually evolved into something that is now called Mobi. Um, it's a nonprofit consortium um, that connects together 80% of the world's automakers. 
um, including GM and others. So, uh, and of course, one of the major uh, use cases for them is autonomous driving, and we continue to engage with them. Um, uh, going back to the history of Ocean, um, once we started um, doing this uh, marketplace and, and whatnot, we, we wanted to say, okay, what does this look like? What does Ocean actually look like? So we explored a lot of different designs through the middle of 2017. In the fall, we, we announced Ocean, um, and we kept refining the design. Um, and uh, fast forward to spring of 2018, so just one year ago, actually less than a year ago, uh, we had our sort of phase one token distribution, and we started building, which was really important. Up till then, we'd had just a, um, you know, sort of a couple people on it engineering-wise, but um, we were able to, to scale up the team. And then the team really started uh, executing very well uh, in terms of engineering with, with a roadmap. So we released a roadmap in July, and then uh, a series of releases after that. So August was the Plankton release. And this was really just about connecting things end-to-end -end in, that, in that first cut. Um, then, uh, in November, was the Trilobite release. And this is where um, basically a lot more of the functionality started to come in. Um, the service agreements started to come in in a big way, um, and uh, the, the stack, and so on. And then finally, uh, January of 2019, uh, so this third release, uh, which is called Tethys, really has three phases. There's the alpha, the beta, and my brain wants to say the gamma, but of course it's the production release. So uh, the alpha we've been running uh, internally in our test net basically since January. And um, now we see that we are in shape to, to ship the beta um, in March 31st. So we're very happy about that. And this beta will be um, very uh, usable, et cetera, for people to uh, build marketplaces, um, build data commons, and whatnot on top. And then the production release will follow. So that's kind of where we've been coming from with Ocean. And kind of where we're headed is the following. So V1, which is you know, about now and the short near future of 2019, like I've mentioned, you can build data marketplaces, data commons, and data science integration. And you will, in the demos, you will see an example of the data commons from Jerry and the data science integration from Marcus, as well as Web2 storage services. We decided to focus on Web2. This is basically cloud compute from Amazon and Azure because that's where the data is right now, right? Um, Web3 is really important to us, but uh, we have to be um, cognizant of where the data of today lies. And then we have a series of um, releases after that, so V2 is about improving these service agreements further, adding things like staking and slashing, having um, uh, compute services in addition to storage services. V3 is when we bring in the incentives, the network rewards, as well as the verified versions of these Web2 and Web3 services, which are essential once you have incentives, otherwise people will game it. Uh, V4 is where we bring in clans, which is basically groups of people um, towards things like collective bargaining and so on, as well as on-chain bounties, which are going to be very useful for long-term sustainability of the network to keep improving it and improving it. And um, actually with V1, we are shipping as a POA because we see that data scientists will not be tolerant at all of very poor performance. OpenML, um, for example, has 20,000 data sets. If you were to put this onto um, a public block, permissionless blockchain right now, you're talking $5,000 to $20,000, depending on how you configure it. That's just too much. Or euros, I should say. We are in Germany, after all. Um, whereas on a POA network, the, the cost uh, gets slashed dramatically. So um, it's not just the cost, but also the latency and so on. So we see that um, permissionless technology, um, fully permissionless decentralized technology is coming. It's not there yet, and we're very hopeful for the efforts. And this is why um, for V5, that's when we plan to move from the POA network that's decentralized, just not as permissionless, to something that is much more permissionless. So this is really the next five releases of Ocean. And you know, we, we see that it's practical and we're pretty happy about that. Now, I believe we get to go to the demos. So we will start. Um, I guess Marcus will come up first. And so this is Marcus Jones. He's a data scientist, an in-house data scientist at Ocean Protocol. And um, he's Canadian, eh? Um, what else? You don't have an Aquaman t-shirt, do you? Uh, just a regular yeah. boring shirt. Okay. Data okay. shirt. Okay. Uh, shall I give you the mic? I'm mic'd up. Oh, you're How's great. The sound? Good. Okay. Awesome. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Marcus. Yeah, thanks. Any data scientists in the house? <laughs> That's great. I know you're all out there, but very quiet. Okay. Yeah. Good. Screen share on. Okay. Project Manta Ray. So, data science powered by Ocean Protocol. Um, so the purpose of this project is to demo some of the core tech that we're building. So our core tech is, of course, the smart contracts, a bunch of microservices, and APIs. But um, as a data scientist, I need to consider how to actually 
use Ocean Protocol and how to make it usable for data science. So this is one great way to jump in to a live environment um, connected to our actual testnet, POA testnet, and start hacking on Ocean Protocol, trying it out, getting to know it, and um, let's get started. So this is running live. You can go to this website anytime, datascience.oceanprotocol.com. Uh, again, it's in alpha, so yeah, please, if you do, then please um, check with me in Gitter and let me know how it's going. And so once you, once you go to this, uh, click on this button, then you start a JupyterLab instance. So if you're familiar with Python or data science, then you'll probably be aware of the Jupyter Notebook environment, which is a way to, to run a Python kernel in a browser. Um, so that's really amazing. And then furthermore, in this project, we're running Jupyter Hub in the cloud. So that means when you click on this button, you actually get your own instance running in the cloud. So this is a unique ID. And it's already pre-configured with, with all of our, our tech. So um, on the left side, we see a bunch of actual notebooks. And so it's designed as like a demo, a tutorial, um, a way to get started programming your own data science workflow or um, maybe programming your own marketplace. You can, you can test it out in a live environment. So the first thing, for example, so they're all sort of organized in sequence. One of the first things you might do is just check if your components are connected. So um, we actually have four endpoints that are running. One of them is the blockchain POA node. Uh, we have a secret store running, and then we have two microservices. So the purpose of this uh, called Aquarius this microservice is to store the metadata of an AI asset. So an AI asset, for example, data set. Um, and what is the metadata? The metadata is all the data that describes that asset. So for a data set, you'd want to put things like um, the description of the data set, the size, maybe some open links to some samples of it so that data scientists can start exploring what the data is. But it's, it's those, of course, things like AI models, um, pipelines, anything that you would, you would need for an AI ecosystem. And then we also have this um, component called Brizo, which is our access control layer. So this provides the, the access control such that when you request access and successfully, uh, if it's a paid asset, if you successfully show that you have the right token, then this uh, right amount of token, then it would grant you access to this service. Okay, so um, in Jupyter Notebooks, we all of these cells are interactive, so you can actually rename things, you can test it out. I'll just scroll to the bottom of this notebook just to speed it up. Um, so this one, all this notebook is doing is checking that your, your, your microservices and your blockchain is actually connected and live. So indeed, these are all open URLs that you can start playing with, and this is all working. So the next thing would be, for example, we can start looking more into the API. So I would just start importing some components. So all of this software is open source um, by the Ocean Protocol Foundation. So you can start forking it if you'd like and inspecting the code. But in any case, this is the main API for Python. We have an API for Python, JavaScript, and Java. Um, it's called Squid because we're Ocean. And in this case, I'm importing the main API class, which is called Ocean. And then we can start iterating through the cells. There's a configuration object, and then I'm I'm simulating a bunch of users in this account. So in this case, this is the main, this is the actual instantiation. So I pass in a configuration, I get back the API <coughs> object. And in this case, we can see, yes, it's actually connected to a bunch of smart contracts running on our nodes. So um, the next thing could be, for example, as a data scientist, you would like to publish an asset. What does publish mean for Ocean? Firstly, the metadata of your asset, which you prepare, is published into Aquarius. And this is the, again, the metadata store, which is gonna store your metadata dictionary or, or JSON document. And most of that is gonna be in the clear, but some of that will be encrypted. So for example, your access to your data set, these URLs will be encrypted, and that's where the secret store comes into play. So for this notebook, we can just quickly iterate through a bunch of cells. Um, so yeah, for example, in this cell, we see that I've, I'm simulating a publisher. So the publisher has an account and an account balance. And this would be the number of Ocean token that you actually have in your account. 
Um, and then we also have for our testnet only a free money function. So you can get free Ocean Token on our testnet only. <laughs> um, and then we get to the metadata. So this, this is just a sample asset, but we have things like um, the name of the asset. So in this case, it's just a PDF, the Ocean Protocol white paper. So if you are a developer, um, this is just a JSON format. And if you automate, let's say you have a thousand data sets sitting on a server, if you want to um, pull out and extract like the description of those assets, the author, you can quickly populate your data sets into a marketplace using this API. Um, so let's get to the interesting stuff. So here I've just changed. So it's all dynamic. I can change the, the price. It's just a JSON dictionary, right? I can change the price of an asset. I can change the name, et cetera. I can inspect the actual files. And here I've just registered an asset into the blockchain and into the metadata store. And that's, that's the return of this cell, is that we see that your asset is now in our registry on the blockchain and it has an ID. So this is the actual ID of an asset. So using this ID, I'm tying this ID also to my own blockchain identity. So let's see which cell it is. That one should show through an error. Yeah, so it's waiting for a trans. Oh, I put a sleep there because it's a blockchain, so I need to be async. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the other cool thing, is that this asset is owned by this wallet ID, or this wallet address, rather. So that means that whoever controls this wallet, whoever controls this blockchain identity, let's say me, I control this asset. So that's the cool thing that the blockchain brings. And of course, on the other end of the marketplace, we would also like to consume or purchase or access as you wish. Um, so again, I'm just going to scroll down. We just simulate a user. We can search. So there's also a search aspect. So the again, I mentioned this metadata store. It's stored in the clear. This is something that's searchable. So I can search for assets which fit a certain category, a number of tags, or a curation rating. And then I can actually go ahead and publish, uh, sorry, purchase. So I check my balance. I see that I have enough. And then I would go ahead and purchase the asset. And then in, it would just appear as a download once it's finished getting the access. Yeah, so it's going to appear here. So we've done it a few times. Um, like the last time was 13 or 14 minutes ago. I'll just show you now. So indeed, we have this test asset. OK, that's great. It works, believe me. Oh. OK, there it is. Works. Um, yeah, that's basically it. That's sort of a quick overview. So again, what's the point of, of Manta Ray? Um, so again, just to summarize, you can go to this link. You can create your own instance of a Jupyter Notebook um, pre-configured with our, our uh, API and pre-configured with the connection endpoints to our testnet. Um, of course, this can also be connected to our production net as well, very easily. Um, so again, the point of this is to, to provide some demos and tutorials if you want to start exploring the underlying protocol. That's it. Next. <laughs> So thank you very much, Marcos. And now we will have the second uh, demo, part two of two, um, by, by our colleague Jerry. And he will be talking about our reference commons marketplace. So this is basically a means to publish data and to uh, search for it. And it's not price data. One thing that I'll mention right now, too, kind of the three sets of front ends we think about are, are the priced data marketplaces, the commons marketplace, and the data science tools. So, um, and the main difference between the priced and the free, of course, is price, right? Um, and uh, so if you want to have a priced marketplace, you can take this commons marketplace and, of course, add a price and do whatever you want there. Um, these are all meant as references for people to go and build their own um, uh, data marketplaces, et cetera. So uh, this is one thing we encourage of all of you. Maybe every single one of you will be building your own data marketplace in a, 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 you know, a month or a year or something. There's a lot of opportunities in Ocean. So Jerry, you're ready? Yeah. Okay, and do you have a mic? You do. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Take it over. Okay, perfect. 
So I'm going to demo the reference marketplace, which you can see here. So the objective of front-end apps is basically to make everything as simple as possible. So all that, all that code, all that services are hidden behind this simple interface. So we can do simple things like just search, search for assets. And we can see the assets that I registered like before we started. You can also see the details of it. So in the, in the commons marketplace, we want to incentivize people to just share their assets for free. Or if they find some assets that are already public, to just input them in, in the commons marketplace. So I'm going to now go through the process of that. The process has multiple steps. The only first step is essential. So here we have title. It's not really simple. We need to add a file. Perfect. Next step, we can add more information like description and select category. This is all to make just discovery as easy as possible. And we will also incentivize just getting all the proper uh, tagging of data sets on. So it, you will be able to get more, more out of that. And license there. So now here we already see that we are connected with account that is described here. We are using a MetaMask for all of that. And we can start with registering the asset. Now I need to sign with MetaMask account multiple times to either sign the metadata of an asset, either to share my public key, or and to actually create a transaction of, on blockchain that stores all that. And there we have we see the transaction has been confirmed, and we see here that your ha your asset has been published, so we can see the asset itself here. There. So now this flow is now I'm gonna switch to the video of a different flow. So this this uh, this is uh, not Commons Marketplace anymore. This is the Ploiston, which is geared more towards the companies. And we can see that it has uh, the sim similar publish flow, but it has two different buttons on the bottom where to add an asset file. So you can see here, where we basically can log in into Azure S3 storage or Azure, uh, or Azure storage. And you go through the authorization process. You go through all the security stuff. Okay, and then you can click and retrieve and already just pick from whatever asset you have on the Azure. And that is then automatically shared. The same you can do for AWS, for the S3 bucket. Yeah, and yeah, that's it. So. Now I can just move to the end of the video where I can, we can see the, yeah, so we can see the, the purchase flow of an asset. Yeah, so we click purchase, we sign the service agreement that is basically just give me access to the specific uh, asset. We sign, we pay the, we pay the, the ocean tokens. And in the end, the file is provided to the client and shown. So that's it, simple as possible. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Cool. So uh, Jerry surprised me. So we actually um, demoed all three. We had a, a 
priced marketplace with Ploiston. We had a Commons marketplace with the Commons marketplace framework and the data science tooling with Manta Ray. So thank you very much again, Jerry and, and Marcus. Um, and now actually, uh, we are just heading towards the wrap up. Uh, we're now just, um, I'm at the end of my talk as well. And at this point, uh, I will open the floor to Q&A. Also joining me, we have Don Gossin, who is uh, overseeing the execution as well. So he's in the back. He can, if you want to come to the front as well, uh, you want to be there? OK. So yeah. Yeah, so, so we have, um, you know, someone who likes the, the deep dark sea and stuff, and I guess I'm in the light right now, but I'm really just trying to expose Aquaman. So um, let's uh, hand off to Q questions. Um, so if you want to ask a question, please wait, uh, raise your hand, and Daniel will come to you and give you the mic. Um, it's important because uh, otherwise uh, we can't do surveillance on you. <laughs> please go ahead. Thank you for the presentation, guys. Um, my question is, how is it related to the prices? How are the prices formed? In these presentations, I assume they were fictitious? Uh, in this and presentation, yeah, yeah. here, like, um, you can have a fixed price, but overall, it's actually subject to a smart contract, so you can right. do it however you want. Um, so and when, our view, go ahead. When, when do you, yeah, in, in real situation, when do you have a fixed price, then when uh, is, so how is then, how is then exactly the, um, the, the price formed? Yeah, what are so the mechanisms for price formation? Exactly. So actually, overall, um, we think that there, over, up till now, the world has really had only closed, opaque markets. So there's, while there's people exploring price, it really hasn't um, flourished very much because we haven't had a very good sort of um, substrate or economy to have an open um, discovery price mechanism in general. And so we believe that there's quite a few different options. There's fixed price, there's auctions, and they could be, you know, uh, coming up from the bottom like English auctions, the traditional. You can have Dutch auctions coming down, you can have channel auctions. You can have royalties. Uh, we think actually royalties are pretty interesting because then um, you can, for example, charge as a function of the value that you add. Um, a nice example of that is how Numerai works with its you know, 10,000 data scientists um, all submitting algorithms towards the, a hedge fund. And then whoever has the best algorithm gets a higher percentage of the profits, right? So that's actually a very, very nice um, uh, uh, royalties approach that it's really about the value that you add with your data or with your algorithms. And there are other pricing strategies too. They can get more and more complicated and Ocean supports all of them. And uh, kind of our goal is to provide a substrate for very quick, rapid experimentation on this. We can, you know, maybe there will be, um, you know, one data set that has five different pricing strategies and one will end up being dominant. So this is really just about exploration. Um, thanks for the question. It's a great question. I mean, just a quick example. I am a um, guy who has an aqua farm and I'm producing, or a farmer producing data, data on water quality. And uh, I have my sensor, uh, which was actually paid by an insurance company. And I'm not pretty comfortable with uh, the insurance company's price offering on my data. And I simply just want to, uh, you know, see who is giving more on my data. I mean, just having it very simple. And I'm a farmer. Sure. Peasant. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, that scenario doesn't exist right now, right? So okay. benchmarking. We need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that part I understand, right? So, but benchmarking the price of that data is going to be entirely derived from the market. So basically, the only thing the farmer can do at that point is either use the benchmark that the insurance company is trying to provide him mm -hmm. that he's not satisfied with and release the asset to the, the community with a markup, right? right, that he's comfortable with. Right. So the benchmark is being provided by the insurer in that case. Right. R really what we're tackling at this point though is existing assets from companies that have put in work to create them. And it's a question of what is, What's, what's the measure of that work, and how, how do you equate that to some monetary function? And the best way to do that at this point in time is to look at the associated expenditures that went into creating them. Yeah, we go and back to Marx, but it's, it's like, okay. But that's what, provides, that's what provides that first stepping stone to benchmarking what the, the cost of these assets should be. 
Um, kind of related to that, are, are there ways that you could propagate back the, the payment to, to everybody who's contributed to that data? Let, let's say I have a small company or like a bunch of smaller companies or individuals who want to contribute to, to a larger data set. And you want to keep that larger data set as one data set, but, but you want people to add to that and then get like a kind of an appropriate share of yep. whatever payment. Yeah, no, that's the intent, right? So providing this means of... of uh, high fidelity on the provenance component provides the attribution to all of the steps that went into that. So it's not just, you know, a, a, an aggregated or consolidated data set and all of the upstream providers of, of data assets that led into that consolidated asset get paid. Also, the, the compute providers that went into the transformations and the algorithms that created it. I mean, Marcus has got um, use cases where you're starting to identify who's actually adding to this kernel um, within the ML pipeline, right? So it goes back to the originator of, you know, the new code or a delta on this data set and that sort of thing. Yeah. So that, I mean, these are in the, in the uh, roadmap. Yep. Hi, guys. I really love the demo, especially the uh, Jupiter stuff. I think you're going to kill it. Um, my question is, what's the biggest... Uh, um, data you can actually store right now? Um, so our intent isn't to store any data and just yep. to access it. So mm -hmm. sky's the limit on what we can access. Right. Um, the providers that you support for integrating as part of that work? I mean, if, if I have a data set in Amazon S3, would that work? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, S3 bucket, uh, um, any sort of blob storage. Um, you know, relational data stores, data warehouses, I mean, those can get into the terabytes themselves. Um, you know, we don't have an API for uh, mainframes yet, <laughs> so we're not going to the operational data stores, but, you know, that, that, that could uh, also be a potential um, to add on later on. Uh, but yeah, it, it, there really is no limit to the size of the data that can be made available. Um, what, it's use case dependent though, right? It's also going to be dependent on the type of compute that's available. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, in some cases, um, you know, you, you indicated that, you know, someone can allow for part of the data set to become available, but in certain cases before paying for the asset, you need to be verifying it, so. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the tricky you part may be in, doing in things like cases. partitioning the, the data set, pulling out either the extracts that you need and then analyzing those and um, establishing the verification on that partition. But again, it's hard to just say, you know, uh, are we going to ubiquitously support every type of data and all sizes of data? Well, it's actually dependent on the use case. So, um, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, and I guess maybe you're already working this, that you know, if someone can make a verification method available for someone to run on those data, and that would be part of the deal. Yeah. So um, you can you can view the verification method so you understand what it does. So the re the requirement now is that the onus is on whoever is doing the publishing, right? Mm -hmm. That the check is okay. That that this is a valid asset and it's is what you said it is, right? So doing things like checksums um, on the asset itself. Yeah, that's a simple method. Yeah, complementary to that. And actually, before I say the complementary, um, it's really useful to emphasize, yeah, Ocean isn't storing the data. It's, um, as part of the decentralized orchestration, it's doing access control. So it's basically orchestrating um, sharing of keys back and forth. And then if I, if I am iterating with Don, Ocean is playing this sort of decentralized middleman. Once Don gives me access, that data is flowing directly to me, not through Ocean, right? Um, so on this overall question then, um, uh, to your uh, the service, uh, you might ask, you know, is uh, how do you verify it? So one of them is just straight out. If I provide a, a terrible data set and you know Don buys it for me, then um, Don will be like, this is terrible, and he'll never buy from me again. You know, this isn't generally a single prisoner's dilemma; it's iterated, right? And so over time, you know, the, um, the marketplaces can be building a reputation and so on. So that's one partial one solution. The second is. Um, uh, like you had talked about bringing the compute to the data for some form of verification. And this is where we have um, Ocean itself isn't actually just about data marketplaces. It's more general. It's actually uh, AI compute services, where the services are providing data or providing compute and in all sorts of shapes and forms, right? Um, eventually, we will have a more sort of 
pure Web3 verified data availability as well. Um, uh, but this is sort of one, walk one step at a time, right? Um, you know, for Web2, we can do um, checksums and so on, and bring in decentralized, bring in oracles, decentralized oracles and so on. Yeah. So it's a walk before you run thing. So it's multiple um, steps. It's a great question though, because, mm -hmm. you know, verifying whether or not this was good data or not, it's, it's really a, a key question. Well, I, I would argue, what is good data, right? Again, it's use case dependent. True. You know, You've built that on top of Ethereum, right? Uh, it's a parity EVM, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the uh, gas price is fluctuating. Does that affect somehow your business model? No. So we've got a POA, so that the, the we've negated the gas price. Yeah. Uh, how do you ensure that the data of similar kind is more or less in the same format. So uh, to make actually several data useful across different providers, I want to always ensure and somehow enforce the strategy of aligning the data between other providers. Do you have some strategy in mind sure. for that? So initially, I think it's, it's going to be primarily a curation function. Um, where perhaps a problem statement is emitted to the ecosystem and curators go out and find data assets that pertain to the question and fit the format for the model that's going to run against them. Um, however, for things like especially structured data sets, I mean, it's r relatively simple to actually check the file structure, right? You check the header. Um, whether the data types within the columns conform to the specification, let's say in the metadata, uh, so that whoever wants to train against them has an understanding of what the underlying files are. Um, as we move forward, there will be more sophisticated methods, most likely at some point of transforming the asset into the format that you actually want it in. Um, but we're not at that point yet. Thanks. Another quick, uh, quick question. Um, do you make any, the difference between um, original data harvest and uh, secondary data? So um, this goes back to the earlier question. Um, basically through, I'm, I'm assuming what you mean is like compounding assets on one another, right? Um, so I create an asset, Trent discovers it, adds some more information to it, creates a new asset, am I still being associated with that, with that data set? Is that, what, yeah. I mean, you're probably not passing, you know, any token value back to whoever authored the book at this point, you know, maybe at some point in the future. Um, but no, it, within the provenance trail, the, you know, that is the intent, that everybody in that value chain is uh, rewarded for the work that they perform. And perhaps complementary, um, you know, overall, uh, the type of data can be, you know, initial raw data, it can be clean data, it can be secondary, it can be models, it can be Jupyter notebooks, all of this, right? Um, in terms of, like, you know, one question is, it kind of related to you, is if I don't have the copyright on the data and I, I just put it up there and I start charging for it, what will happen, right? Well, it's the same thing as if I take a photograph that I don't own uh, and I put it onto a, an, uh, a digital photograph marketplace today, um, I'm going to get sued. Right? If someone's going to come after me, they will sue me, I will get charged or something in some way. And this is really um, the roles of the marketplaces themselves, generally, um, and the laws surrounding it around copyright and so on, right? So um, Ocean itself um, is no different. It will leverage uh, you know, the incentives of the marketplaces and people generally wanting to be, to be good actors in this sort of iterated prisoner's dilemma framing. Um, related to the, like, you, so you mentioned that you have your own uh, proof of authority network instead of um, Ethereum, and instead of using the pre-existing proof of authority networks, you're launching your own. And then you had a lot of, I guess, like legal challenges um, and everything around that. Um, uh, uh, can you summarize that process? Uh, why, why you made that decision and what were the decision around that? Yeah, so uh, 
Uh, the, the key thing to start with is uh, we actually spend a lot of time thinking about this. We actually have a blog post detailing this in general. Um, and uh, so we, we ha started having weekly meetings and asking questions and looking for answers going back many, many months. And, um, you know, we were building with a default hoping that, you know, maybe Ethereum would get scalable enough. Um, but uh, overall, we, the, a key constraint we had for our users is our users are data scientists and AI people, right? They um, expect and demand um, low latency. They expect and demand um, the transactions to go through. They, they need high throughput. If you have a data set of 10,000 data points, sorry, uh, if you have 10,000 data sets, you know, OpenML, many enterprises have this, um, they don't want to be spending $10,000 to get it onto the network. It's just ridiculous to them. Um, and you know, so the world of big data these days is really actually about um, for AI, right? So they are used to large scale, you know, um, and it, it, uh, we do not get a, a free pass simply because we say the word blockchain, right? Um, so this was really the key consideration that we had. And uh, on the flip side, though, there's a lot of great benefits, for example, to shipping on Ethereum mainnet. Um, you get to interact with the existing components. Uh, you don't have to spend any effort on, on deploying of, of the, the, the nodes themselves. You still do have to account for some liability, um, of course. Um, but there's more liability for the people running the keeper nodes. And um, you know, before we built Ocean, we built BigchainDB. And we, um, as we were working to roll out this public network IPDB, we asked these questions. You know, every single um, entity running a, a keeper node uh, is subject to the laws of the land with, with data processing and so on, GDPR, all this sort of thing. So um, we did uh, a sort of a two-pronged approach to this. First of all, we designed Ocean such that um, the, the data that's hitting the, the blockchain itself is minimal. In fact, we've um, kept out the PII. The, uh, all the metadata uh, for searching is actually one level up off-chain, uh, run by the marketplaces themselves. Um, even the URLs themselves are encrypted. And so uh, this actually really, really minimizes the risk from um, any PII leaking out at all that way. Um, of course, the marketplaces, et cetera, they have to run their own data processing agreements like they would normally if you're running a, a centralized marketplace, right? Um, so that's the first part. The second uh, prong is um, iterating uh, uh, and engaging directly with, with lawyers who have a lot of experience in the blockchain and data processing space. So we've actually had long-term relationships with many lawyers in, here in Germany and otherwise, and we've been engaging with them very directly on this um, and working out a very precise means of governance and data processing. So it's, it's extremely well thought through. We're, we're happy with it. We were a lot reluctant to do it. Uh, we, um, looking around, we did not find any POA networks that had gone through the legals that didn't restrain us to just, sorry, the only uh, POA network that we found that had gone through the legals was um, POA.network in the USA, but it restricts you to being in USA. And to us, that was a showstopper. We're not going to be constrained to one jurisdiction like that. So that, that's the summary. Um, yeah. Actually, I should mention on this too, um, with Ocean, we, we are having a token bridge to the Ethereum mainnet, and this actually allows Ocean tokens to um, be used in a decentralized finance setting. So you can have things like um, uh, interactions with Uniswap, so you can have decentralized exchange in that way, um, or uh, you know, Dharma for lending and this sort of thing, like lending of data, this is, this is quite nice. Another thing, um, a lot of the other composability questions, Ocean itself is a network of networks, right? Where we have these services coming in for data, or for compute. So um, a, a lot of the other composability questions kind of fall to the side simply because Ocean itself does that. Zeppelin OS, we're using this for upgrades, but we can simply run the, those smart contracts uh, on the POA network. All right, maybe we'll wrap it up with that. Um, so thank you once again for the great questions and for being a very patient audience. Thank you. And thank you, Don. <laughs>